Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. My name is Kathleen Quo, and I am a program manager with Nevada Humanities. And on behalf of the organization, it's my pleasure to be with you all. So for those of you who don't know who we are, Nevada Humanities is our state's affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. We try to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. So this creative workshop series is a part of our Nevada Reads literary programming. In 2022, we're continuing the theme of cultivating environmental literacy that we began in 2021. And that's when we selected two memoirs that encourage us to celebrate and appreciate the natural world and to think more deeply about where we live and our connection and responsibility to the earth. So this series in particular was inspired by the themes and illustrations found in one of those memoirs, World of Wonders by Amy Izuka Matato. It's a really beautiful book, Inside and Out. And if you haven't already read it, we hope that you're inspired to do so after the workshop ends. So as we engage in conversations about the natural world and the land we inhabit during this year's Nevada Reads programming, one of our goals is to have our readers become better stewards of the earth and to learn more about the land that we live on. So as part of this goal, I wanted to acknowledge where I'm sitting today in Nevada. We're gathering on the traditional land of the Northern Paiute, Southern Paiute, Western Shoshone and the Washoe people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. So to learn more about the land that you reside upon, I'm gonna share a link in the chat to help you out with this. So I'm gonna introduce our wonderful workshop leader for today now. <laughs> Kristen Muser has been painting the land for many years throughout California and Nevada. She currently teaches online Zoom workshops on essential landscape elements, including cacti, mushrooms, flowers, waterfalls, creeks, lakes, rivers, hills, mountains, cliffs, journal page design, and more. She moved to Las Vegas in 2018, where her fascination with the desert landscape has flourished in nearby Red Rock Canyon. Kristen's workshops focus on nurturing a deep connection to nature through the ability to see through skill building exercises, including color mixing and unique exercises that demystify the art and science of drawing, painting, and writing. So you can find her schedule and further information about her ongoing workshops at her website. And I'm going to put that in the chat now as well. During the workshop, Kristen will be referencing a handout. So if you did not receive this in your email, or if you don't have it with you right now, I'm gonna put that link here just so you have it all and you can look at it during the workshop. And finally, as a reminder, um, we would love to have questions for you, from you today during the workshop. So please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if we have time during the workshop, we'll answer them during, but we will save them primarily for the end if there's time. And then if we aren't able to get to your question, we will email everyone afterwards with Kristen's answers. So Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you again. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, it's um, really a pleasure to be able to, um, to share um, my work with you all and um, and thank you to Nevada Humanities for sponsoring this program and for allowing me and asking me to to um, to share my work. So um, I'm very um, happy to start with a uh, uh, basically a slideshow that I put together to start to show what um, my take on um, how to create depth in your journal. So let me start with that right now. And I'm gonna come back here. Just a moment, I'm gonna set up my screen. Okay. So the name of this workshop is uh, Creating Depth in Your Watercolor Nature Journal or in your uh, regular painting practice, whichever you use. Um, I love to journal because it really, um, the joining together of uh, imagery as well as notes um, really brings a page to life. It brings a sense of um, immediacy to your page so that when you come back um, days, months, years later, you can re-experience uh, your, your, um, your time in nature. Uh, this is a little tiny um, sketch, uh, painting sketch of Red Rock. And um, it basically uh, 
in a very simple way um, shows the um, many of the landscape techniques that you'll find on the handout. So on your handout, let me switch over to that. You'll see there are three columns. And in the left-hand column, this is the techniques, detail, line, contrast, size, overlapping, color temperature, color intensity. And then the way to read this is the, think, think of it the same object uh, and how it looks in the foreground and in the background. So in the, uh, the, for the technique of detail, in the foreground, you're going to see a lot of uh, detail. In the background, you'll see less detail. Um, it, regarding line work, it'll be a little heavier in the foreground, lighter in the background. Contrast will be hard light and dark in the front, in the foreground, and soft light and dark in the background. Uh, size, the same object will appear larger in the foreground, smaller in the background. Sometimes um, the, we get tricked by a large, uh, a small object being in the foreground and a larger um, uh, object in the background, so you overlap them, here we go. And then one of the most important things is color temperature and these two, color intensity, they're very similar. But color temperature, um, if, you, if your foreground, if you put a, keep it warmer in color, um, it'll pull it forward. When it's cooler, it'll push it back. And the same with color uh, brilliance and intensity. The more intense it is, uh, it'll, it'll bring you forward, the more, um, um, when it's further in, in um, the distance, it will be paler and um, less intense. And then sometimes you won't use all of these at the same time, but um, you will um, find uses for them. So, <clears throat> so um, referencing those uh, landscape techniques, um, it, we have more. Uh, detail in the front, and it gets less in the background to where we're just seeing little clumps of these um, bushes. We aren't seeing any kind of detail at all. Um, the uh, contrast is more in the front, less in the back. Um, and as we go back in, uh, in the background, the color of the green, gets less and less intense, it gets paler, duller. Um, and in terms of um, uh, going, showing mountains in the background, as you look through the atmosphere, you start to see more and more blue uh, in the uh, mountains in the background. And that definitely pushes you, pushes those back. In Red Rock, actually, these are Sandstone, sandstone, which are warmer than the limestone. So you've got kind of two things going on. You've got the local color, or what we call the actual color of the mountain, and then you get the um, the uh, the distance, you know, atmospheric color. So I'm going to show you several of my um, pages, and uh, you'll get an idea for um, how to use these techniques. So here we have mountains in the background and they're bluer. These are the, basically the same type of rock. This is up in Yosemite in Tuolumne Meadows uh, area. Um, but you can see with the detail in the trees, here in the foreground or close middle ground, you actually see the trunks, you can see the branching. You get a, a, more of a sense of the, the darks and the lights. And then in the background, it all fades. Here we only see uh, some vertical strokes that show it may indicate that there are trees there and the color is, is more muted. Um, as we work ourselves forward, we start seeing bushes that actually, and grasses that actually have uh, more contrast, um, some rocks with a lot of detail, which you don't see back here. 
and um, and bushes that um, bring you know the foreground is definitely much closer. Here we are back in Red Rock. Um, more intense color in the foreground as you go into the background is more dull, and then uh, and then very pale. And this is mainly uh, just. Uh, rock and gravel and, and sand in the background. Um, and then we go into the, uh, the sandstone hills, mountains, and in the back, the limestone. And here we show on this little one, more detail in the rocks in front, less in back. So that definitely just pops those forward, uh, even though it's, it's simply shading, but it's, it's more a contrast. And even though we've got contrast back there, uh, other things are working within the drawing to make you realize you're going back into a, a little bit of a, a slot canyon there. Here we have um, the distant hills, the middle ground, and these have a little bit of green tone. It, it, it helps us to know that there are some, there is foliage, there are trees there but there's no detail. And then this is middle ground. These start bringing, getting more detail, just little triangular spikes. And then we come close and we have the actual tree trunks and branches um, and shading close to the, the, uh, the tr tree trunks and detail in the rocks where we see, we don't see any in the background. These are two different kinds of rocks. It also may indicate that there's some cloud cover, but I haven't indicated any clouds up here. So I, I'm, my memory is that they're a different kind of uh, a darker rock. <clears throat> this little guy um, I wanted to show you because we're looking deep into the um, background here of this area. We're on a path on the right and we're making our way up into that area. So we're seeing um, this area kind of crunch together <laughs> and then and from a slightly different angle. And, um, and then we have trees. Now the trees um, are in the foreground are much more detailed, uh, warmer. Um, as we go back into space, we have trees that are, are darker but they're um, less descriptive, have less detail. So even though they're darker um, and they, instead of getting paler as they go back, they um, are simple in form. So that is, you've got two things working, the simplicity of form and detail, but they're dark, but it helps us, um, to my eye anyway, it makes sense, <laughs> hopefully to yours. Um, and then here we have um, these trees here are actually closer than these indications up here and up here. So, and it also gives you kind of a focus when you add um, detail to a certain area. And then the rocks are um, going back. They're pretty much, um, uh, they similar colors going back, but the detail gives a sense of um, where you're, uh, it's leading you into the background. Uh, here we have um, with water, what happens when you're creating depth is in the background, there's usually, it's much darker. And um, because you're not looking down into the water, it just, it's in the distance and it has less detail and it um, is much deeper. And then when you come into shore, you're starting to look down into the water. You're even seeing a little reflection of the hill. Um, so the color changes. A lot of detail here, less up here almost no detail, but the suggestion of more of the uh, bushes up there. This is the little um, uh, 
picture that was in the fairy in the beginning. Um, this is something that I really enjoyed doing because it was, this is the uh, Joshua tree blossom. And then I wanted to put, give it a little sense of space behind it. Here we have, um, these are like mm, business card sized little um, sketches. And um, here in the foreground, I used a lot of pencil work to show the, um, to show the uh, contrast because in a little painting like this, it's hard to get uh, a crisp sense of where the dark should go. So I, I do love to use pencil work and you'll see in my drawing that I use that a lot uh, to create my textures and to define areas. So here you can see this bush, um, or probably it's grasses that are very much more golden and they really pull you forward. Um, here we have the same sort of color in the hills. In the background, this one, this hill goes back is behind and it is more dull, a little darker, a little redder, but starting to be a little less bright. So we'll review these again. Um, we have the detail more in front, less in back, line heavier in front, lighter in back, contrast, hard light and dark in the front, soft muted light and dark. The diff distance between the light and dark in the back is much less, whereas the distance between the hard light and dark is much more of a contrast. Size in general, larger in front, smaller in back, overlapping. Um, if you're, when in doubt, overlap. If you wanna show the relative size of, of your um, objects. And then color temperature is really important. Um, I use often in the foreground, something called uh, your quinacridone gold. And sometimes after the whole painting is finished, I'll just do a, a wash of that color in the foreground. So this is the painting that we did yesterday or on Wednesday. And this, I'm showing this to you. This is the size, basically I did it out. So I wanted, I didn't want to do it huge um, because it wouldn't be accurate. To, it's not how you would see it. But here we have the Mona Lake and we have my painting of it, um, trying to get the same sense of, of distance. We have the mountains in the background. We have the tufa in the foreground and bushes that get more and more um, intense as we move forward. So this is the painting we're gonna work with today. So give me a second here and I will um, adjust my screen so that you can see. Kristen, while you're adjusting, we had some questions about materials. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit about what you use um, and what kind of pencils? Yes, give me one second while I, I just want to concentrate on this. Um, and, but as soon as I, I get back, I'll definitely do that. Um, okay. <laughs> Always take a second here. Okay, um, Kathleen, are you seeing um, my journal on the right? Yes. Okay, I want to just change something right here. And that's still right? Your journal on the right? Yep, it's showing up. 
Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so let me answer the question, which is, um, what was the question again? Uh, we had a few questions about the materials that you're using, um, mm -hmm. like any particular kind of pencils, and if you ever use watercolor pencils. I don't use watercolor uh, pencils. I don't have anything against them. It's just that I kind of like to stick with the um, materials that I teach with. Um, and I find the more I use these, the simple palette and colors, the more, um, the more I'm able to um, really understand them. But um, you could get a lot of the same effects with color, with watercolor pencils. Um, and the second question, um, the pencil I use, it's an H, it's a, a very simple, um, it's actually from Office Depot. Um, it's a 0.7 whip and it's an HB or a B um, uh, hardness. And I, I like the whip not to be a 0.7 because it's a thick enough so that it can, um, you can write with it on this paper easily. Um, and um, it doesn't, when, I'm, when I do my shading, it doesn't snap. So I, it's, um, I'm very happy using that, um, this pencil. And then I use a blue pencil. You'll, I'll be going through all this when I start my painting. I use a blue pencil and then I use a water brush, which has a constant stream of um, clear, fresh water, which is really um, out in the field. It's really important because um, then you're not having to carry around uh, a water container. You're not dumping dirty water into the environment. Um, everything is, is um, you know, a cleaner brush on your, on, um, I do it on my, um, my sleeve here. Uh, this is a sock. And um, so there's, you know, it's basically leaving a, a very light footprint um, in the environment. That's really important to me. Uh, and then my palette is very small. Um, It has um, eight colors in it. Um, it has quinacridone pink. And these are three yellows. They're all the same. This one is used to mix with the um, pink to make oranges down here. And this one over here is mixed with cyan to make greens. And then over here, we turn the magenta or pink over here and we mix it either with the cyan or the ultramarine blue to make our violets. So every color down here, we wanna keep down here. We do not um, start mixing these colors with these colors because then we have a lot of, um, it it's, um, makes it hard to get back to these really fine jewel colors when we need them. So we do most of our color mixing up here. And, um, I usually do my greens here. This is, uh, ends up being a combination of colors. Um, and you can do a little bit of mixing up here. So these are my eight colors, uh, quinacridone pink, which I call magenta, and then yellow and cyan. This middle yellow is used just for when you want it to make, um, paint something yellow. So you don't use it for mixing with other colors. That uh, keeps it as, as clean as possible. So this is cyan, this is uh, our um, uh, blue um, uh, in the um, primary colors, we have blue, yellow, and magenta. And then this is ultramarine, I use that for creating skies. Um, and sometimes I mix the two of these, the cyan and the blue, um, so that, um, because the sky always looks different, sometimes it's uh, more turquoise, sometimes it's very pale blue. Sometimes it even has like a violet cast. And this is my uh, purulent green, which is a starting point for trees. Um, and then this is the uh, quinacridone gold, which is the color I was talking about that um, is a little 
mixed in with other colors. It's very um, golden and brightens up other colors. Over here we have old, uh, burnt umber, and then over here we have um, shadow violet. So those eight colors are all that I use. And um, you can go to my website under, um, under kits and there's a tutorial video and you can learn how to mix these colors yourself. Um, and on my website, you can either purchase the, the um, uh, palette alone with the colors or a full kit. So that's a little rundown on the kit. Um, also, everything fits into this little mesh package or pouch. Um, the other thing I use, say I told you the blue pencil, um, and that's for uh, basically doing your first pass of uh, painting and drawing. And then here is the, um, the um, mechanical pencil, the graphite. And then sometimes I also use um, this jelly roll. Um, it's a uh, uh, white gel pen and I use it for very sparingly um, to bring little points, points of light back into a painting if need be or to correct the color um, and so it brings it back to a lighter color. Okay. So now we'll get started. This is our, um, let's see, make sure I got this right. This is going to be the painting we'll work on. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back to this full page again. So I start, I'm going to start my page with a, um, let's see. Start my page with one uh, vertical line down the middle. And then I also add another line next either side of it. So I'm creating a page where I can put two paintings on it. And then along the bottom, about a quarter of an inch up, I create another blue line. And on the top, the same thing. As well as on the side. And then for the purpose of a demonstration, it creates a, a nice, um, uh, you know, layout for the page. So we're going to do our color mixing down here. Um, I'll be working on this side. And then with the graphite pencil, I outline. this area. So the blue pencil, it gave me, maybe it wasn't perfect, but it gave me a guideline so that when I came back with my graphite, I have something to work with. And it eliminates the um, necessity for a lot of erasing. I've noticed if I ever forget this a blue pencil step, I um, have a lot more tendency to be erasing to try and get, um, get things correct. So let me get this photograph back up. Okay. Maybe I have a little bit more. So I I don't want my my view to be too much bigger because I'd like it to be more what you it actually looks like on the page. So the page, my page is five and a half tall by eight and a half wide, the full uh, page of the journal. Uh, so this is actually going to be a little bit bigger. You can see how big my hand is. Okay. So first of all, uh, we have a lot of depth in this painting. We have a lot of different levels, um, and it's definitely um, it's definitely a Nevada scene. <laughs> 
or Southwest scene. So I would like to go ahead and start with um, doing a basic, uh, to show you a basic um, proportion. So I'm, I'm making a little tick mark along the left, from the left side. So I'm, I'm working with the sky and then the mountains at the top and then a little bit bigger area for this area here and then leaves the rest for um, the main, uh, the, almost the closest part, although we have this part down here. So let me go ahead and clear, make a, do that a little bit more clearly for you. So um, there won't be much room for sky. So I've made my line and now I'm going to, um, to sketch in the basic shapes of this um, background. We have the slope of this the triangle on the left here. And then we have the slope of this other gravelly looking hill. And then we have this little piece in the distance and just going down so I want to check does this shape look about right it's like pretty good <laughs> so you can see I can just sort of work my way into this painting and into these shapes with my blue pencil and later I can go in and modify it, even with my blue pencil here. So there's this big shot, shaded area. Um, I want to start getting this, this sense of uh, this, for, this cliff in the foreground. Just pop this in down here. So this is going to be a little complicated in here. Um, so this is where a situation where I'm kind of finding my way with my blue pencil. And um, I know because I have this blue pencil down here and I kind of figured it out. Um, it, it, boy, it, it really helps me. I'm not a person who can just go boom right into it. So those of you who are new to sketching um, and painting, remember these, there are uh, tools that you acquire through um, you know, visual tools that you learn and also phys physical tools like a blue pencil that can help you. And last but not least, we have this uh, let's see, nice big um, bush here. And we have a little bit of one, we have a smaller bush here, and one kind of popping in from the side of this here. 
I'm gonna ref refine um, this, um, this shape here. And I'm gonna leave out this thing on the left. I think it will confuse the painting. This is actually a double fill, but it has a, uh, well, a side and then more of a front. So again, I'm gonna pop that in. Okay, so now it's time to go in with my graphite and start to refine this a little bit. So I'll start up the top here and really follow. I'm always going back to the original scene um, to try to get it as accurate as possible and just use these blue lines as kind of guide and you know to guide me along. So it's very easy to make these just very, um, either give them too much detail or not enough. And I like to, when I'm doing round mountains, I like to create them with a series of not rounded lines, but straight lines. It gives um, rocks and hillsides a real sense of um, st uh, stability. Um, kind of architectural feel. So you can see I'm not following my blue line exactly, but it's it's given me a framework to work with. So I'm gonna give this much more detail in the shape as it goes along. Okay, getting there. All right. Um, more. Excuse me, we need a little bit more in here. Okay. So 
So I'm going to use quite a bit of tone in here to get a sense of these um, the shadow area. So I'm going to use just um, straight up and down shapes, uh, strokes, excuse me. Making sure that I leave and leave some um, light areas. So I really love to see the shadows as shapes. It, it, um, I'm gonna do a little bit of tone there too. This will make my, uh, my painting go much easier if I have tone here so that when I actually um, paint, I don't have to pick a different color or a different uh, strength for each area. Because I've already created these darker, darker areas. So my uh, technique is kind of a combination of drawing and painting, but the, the drawing part is, is real important to me. Um, and sometimes the most challenging. Um, so I'm going to leave my detail mostly to all of this in here, this area here that I've been working with. And this back here is all going to be pretty simple, maybe with a little bit of um, simple texture with my, my pencil. Little lines of um, these bushes in the background, shrubs, bushes. A little sense of the direction of these. There's some detail in here that has some much slanted direction. Okay, so I, I think so. Just because um, I want to show, I'm just gonna put a little bit, a little bit of what's going on back here, but not a whole lot. little bits of time. So it's not just a, a blank flat wall. Okay. 
Okay, but you can see this is darker. This tone here, there's quite a bit of contrast there. But we'll leave that back there very um, subtle. Okay. So I'm gonna start painting. And we've got some fun colors to mix. Um, we have the blue sky, which on my screen, this may be different than what's on your screen, but on my screen, it's very, um, it, it has quite a bit of um, uh, turquoise in it. So I put some turquoise on my palette, the cyan, and I'm matching the color. And it's a little dark, so I'm going to just remove a little bit of pigment doing that and not sweeping water into it there. And now I'm lightening it. Now it feels pretty good. So I'm gonna pop that in quickly um, and with the side of my brush, not, uh, not just the point. So I usually do start with the, um, the sky because it kind of sets the um, tone uh, for the rest of the painting, if it's too light, um, the you want you know the rest of the painting might end up being too pastel. If it's too dark, um, the rest of the painting will have to be darker because it's the light. The sky is actually you know the it, although the sun's light is shining on these surfaces, the sky is the brightest thing in the in the in the world. <laughs> so um, want to make sure that it doesn't get too dark. So then I'm going to work myself down. So that what I see is a very lovely um, uh, kind of a magenta. Need more magenta in that color swatch. I did a magenta violet color. Now I may need to add a little more blue to what I just put down, and I may even go. No, I, I'm feeling pretty good about that, but I'm going to add, take some of my magenta, put it up here in the, up here and mix it with a little bit of shadow violet. And that's more, I think it needs a little bit more blue. And when I say blue, I mean ultramarine blue. Now that's too blue. So I, I'll dip into, a couple of different areas for that. And so let's see how this, this looks. And it doesn't hurt to leave a little bit of white um, just to show that there's light back there. We can always cover it over if, if it's too distracting. Now I'm gonna go back in with my magenta A little bit more of a magenta color. You can see how much I do, how much I test. So the magenta is going to be a little bit more of a closer what's in the foreground. And when I, I'm gonna go back with the blue uh, and that'll push that back a little further. Now, watercolor, if you're not familiar with it, dries back in color uh, to, uh, value about 15%. So this is all going to be darker back there or lighter once it all dries. So you sometimes have to adjust um, your uh, either start um, darker and let it dry or know that you're going to have to go back and add a little bit more color. So now this contrast here is going to be a little tricky. Um, so now to get that color, I'm going to um, get magenta on my brush and make a puddle up here in the mixing area. 
And I'm going to add some umber to that. And test it. Just a little darker. So I'm going to add more umber to that. And it's more purple. So I'm going to add um, just a little bit of cyan to that too. Let's see what that looks like. It's gotten dark or too light. So sometimes you have to go in and keep replenishing um, your little area, your little mixing area to get it dark enough. So um, something to note is not to to ever add water to your palette, it naturally gets water from the brush, just pressing down, it's like gravity. The more water that you let sit on your, um, in your palette, the weaker your colors will get. Okay, so I'm starting here and I'm gonna put in some of that detail and then wick off some color. And then soften the edge with just what's uh, the lighter tone that's now on my on my brush. I'm gonna leave a little space for more green, and I'll probably be adjusting this um, this color. I want to get the basics down. I also have to create the difference between this and this. I'm going to let this dry just a little bit and start working back here. Um, this is definitely got to be darker and uh, more gray brown. So it, it'll be uh, some, uh, different than this area down here. So now I'm going to start mixing up these colors. And what I usually use is an orange, which is uh, in my, that I've mixed up in my palette down below here. And test it. And um, actually, I'm going to bring that up and add it to that other mix that I did for this background. But this is nice. And this feels like it has enough of a Color difference that I can I can pretty much tuck it in. It's a little darker here, and it's actually a good color for the shadow areas. Let me actually cover this whole area with that color, so you can see how nicely. Just by having that tone there, it creates, just by uh, the tone just sort of creates the, the color that I want or the value of the color. Add a little bit more of that um, orangey color there. And keep that nice and light up here. So I'm working in trying to get my values right. This is the big, most important part of this, along with um, creating the depth, but I've got to get the values right as we go back into space. Make this a little darker here which means I'm going to have to darken up this even more.
And I'm gonna get back to my clearer um, orange color. for the foreground. So giving a little bit more brush work to this rock in front. So I know that it's closer. Now I need to go back and put more uh, brown. I'm going to mix shadow throughout violet and brown together to create kind of a gray brown and go back over this. And add a little bit of here in green, up here straight from the, from the tube. A little thick now with more with the, um, the rock color. Too orange, too orange. Not good. Okay, and then. I'll start working these this color, this green of the foreground. Let's see, maybe one more thing here. Sorry. My voice fades sometimes when I'm when I'm um, painting. Right now, now to the green. So yellow and cyan make a very grassy green, like almost like an emerald green. I can make it a little, little more grassy, but I'm gonna take this and pop it up here and mix it with my purulene green and then test it. Um, so I think that's gonna work pretty well for most of it. And then I'm going to go right in with purulene green. For the shadow areas. And I like to connect the shadows in bushes so that they don't just feel too spotty. Now these guys down back here are cooler, so I'm going to use just plain um, green, green, which is kind of a gray green. This has gotten a little, um, the paper has started to peel up a little bit. So it's um, a little mushy <laughs> looking. I might be able to work with that a little bit more when it dries, but right now it'll just be more and more kind of mushy. I'm going to bring this down and uh, up in size, down in size, so you can see more of the, sh the size that I'm working on. Um, and also, uh, let's 
I guess that's that's similar to the color that I have on my screen. Um, it's always going to be a little different what you see and what I see because of our screen differences. I've gone back in and I'm, um, I'm just going to add a little bit more. I've added, um, uh, let's see, what have I added here? I've added um, magenta and two and orange. So I want to get a little bit more, con a little bit more focus on this area. It's already kind of dried a little bit. Now, again, what you're seeing might be a little blobby looking as I'm looking at my screen. Uh, see if I can change it a little bit. No, it's just not gonna look quite the same. Um, anyway. Soften this up a little bit. I guess that's fairly similar to what I thought. I'm going to do a little bit more detail in the, the bush in front. Or a little more brush work, really. So, okay, so we have a little bit of time. I may actually go, well, I may do it right now, um, do a little bit more touch up on this um, when it's dry to sort of adjust the values and all. Okay, um, I'm happy to answer some questions now. Great, we've gotten quite a few questions today, okay. which is great. <laughs> okay, let me, uh, let's see, I'll leave the, the, script, the, the sh screen share open. Um, so in case people wanna talk about this painting in particular, okay. All right, I'll try to start uh, from the beginning, from one of the first few questions we got and then work to the end. Okay. So um, this is kind of going back to your materials. Um, how often do you refill your water brush, if at all? And then can you let us know if there's a trick to filling up the water brush? Well, um, I fill it as often as I need to. So today I've used, um, let's see if you can even see, I've used about almost half, I'm almost halfway down, no, maybe a third of the way down when you count this, the breadth of the bottom. Um, it depends on um, how much cleaning you're doing, um, you know, if you need to clean your brush a lot. Since I was using so many similar colors, I didn't need to clean too much because I was, you know, going into this mixing area a lot and um, it all kind of worked together. If I was had really different colors here, I would be cleaning a lot more. Um, and then the trick to, I, I, you open the top, um, you know, when I'm home, I can just go to the faucet and, um, and uh, you know, have the water go straight in. Um, when I'm in the field, I always have a water bottle. And then I just, you know, fold it to this. Usually it helps to hold it 
hold it to the side a little bit and then pour the water in. Okay. Next. <laughs> All right. Someone was wondering, do you work from photographs primarily or do you work sometimes photographs and then sometimes outdoors? I do both. Um, I, if I have the opportunity to be outdoors, I prefer to work outdoors. Um, for my workshops, I've been working, you know, primarily from, well, 100% from photographs. Um, so I like to use the photos for reference if I haven't quite um, finished a um, piece. Um, uh, but in general, I love to be outdoors and I love to um, uh, basically, um, sorry, let me finish this. Um, I love to I love to feel the the air and the little critters that that walk by and to be able to look around at the um, what's behind something to understand it better. So yeah, that's a short great. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone else asked, when you're painting sky, is it it's darker on top of the page yet water is lighter in the foreground? Yes, that's right. Because what we're looking at, it's always a little lighter in the in the bottom at the bottom, um, because you're not looking through as much uh, atmosphere. Great. Um, someone asked, "What is the purple pen that you use to create shadow?" Um, they love being able to use the same color and letting the shadow create dimension. Um, what color am I using for the shadow? The Yeah, they were wondering about the purple that you used for oh, the, the shadow. The purple. Well, it's a combination of cyan and magenta um, with a tiny bit of shadow violet in it. Um, along the same vein, how did you make the orange? Uh, that was a magenta and yellow. Um, I, with a little bit of, let's see, with a little, hmm, a little bit of brown, is I believe what I did. So I started down here by mixing up a, uh, an orange, but it's too, too orangey. So I had some, often I have a lot, just random colors up here, but basically a, an umber and uh, uh, shadow violet and I kind of mixed it in with that, kind of gray it down a little bit. So a combination, so, of, you know, playing around with both the orange that you get from mixing magenta and yellow and then, then adding maybe a little shadow violet to it to tone it down. Okay. Next. Great. Someone asked, how do you keep the paints from falling into each other when you close your palette? Oh, it just doesn't. <laughs> um, it just, um, it just, um, there's so little, I don't have, have a lot of water on my palette because I, I, if I do, I wick it out. Um, there's a little bit of water here, but that won't go anywhere. So I've never had a problem with it, um, you know, um, bleeding onto the other side. Um, could you talk about the sketchbook that you're using today in the demo? Yes, it's a handbook um, sketchbook. Um, it's um, it's uh, basically five and a half by eight and a half. Um, it's called a handbook catalog. Um, it has, uh, I think, a couple hundred pages in it, uh, almost. And then on the back has a little, um, a little pouch and you can put business cards or anything you may have found, any kind of notes you need, or directions to a nice place. Um, and it has a, a ribbon mark the place and then it also has a, an elastic. Um, I really like it. I get it through um, Dick Flick. It's not watercolor paper, but it, it takes watercolor very well. And um, I'm 
I'm very, I've been very happy with it. And because it's not um, watercolor pa paper, it's, you don't have to feel so precious about it. Um, I would have to say that because it's an ivory color, sometimes the colors aren't as brilliant as you would get on a bright white watercolor. But that, that's basically what I, what I use. Next. <laughs> Great, I see we just have two more questions. Um, first one really quickly is, um, it was about the blue pencil, but where do you get the blue pencil? Um, same Dick Brick, it's called a, um, well, unfortunately the blue pencil that I work, use now, it's called a, a Prismacolor color, color call erase, um, light blue. They no longer make the light blue. They only have a blue which is darker, but you can get it through any art store. Um, yeah, or online at um, the brick. Great. And then the last question I have, um, someone really appreciated the camera that you're using for your shot. She said it's very clear and easy to see. So she was just curious um, what you're using. Okay, it is a, um, let's see, IPVO, IPEVO, sorry, IPVO, and it's the V, 4K. It's a, it's a little, um, let's see, I'm gonna see if I can show it to you. I have a jerry rig on today. No, that's not the word, sorry. <laughs> um, I have it, yeah, I can't show it to you because it's taking the picture. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a handy little um, portable guy. It's very small. It's almost the size of an, a cell phone when it's um, out, um, uh, when it's all folded up. And I have it on an extens one of those extending arms that I put onto a, a desktop on a table right next to my work table here. And let's see. I'm gonna stop the share and Oh dear, I'm not sure if I can get, let me see here, let me get back to you. I may have to just live with this, let me see. Are you still, am I still here? Yes, we can still see in here. <laughs> okay. Here we go. That's what I wanted. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Did I fully answer the question? Yeah, I believe you did, Kristen. And then I've let everyone else know we've gotten several repeats of the same question. So right. um, once we share the video recording, uh, we will share all of those in a post workshop survey email. So you can rewatch this. Um, you can pause it whenever you'd like. You can see how Kristen mixes all of her colors. And hopefully that answers um, all the remaining questions that we have. Okay. So, well, yeah. thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, I just wanted to say it was, you know, really, it's always a joy to spend uh, this workshop time with Kristen. So I hope to see you all at future workshops in our series. You can sign up on our website, nevadahumanities.org. That's where you can sign up for a newsletter if you aren't already. Um, and then again, you know, we love email. We love seeing photos of what people have created. We received some really nice ones after a workshop on Wednesday. Uh, we will share those with Kristen. So, you know, please don't be shy. So thank you all again for coming and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>